is always okay. Thank you. So, um, first off, can you tell us uh, who you are and where you're based for our records? My name is Professor Martin Gore. I'm one of the medical oncologists at the Royal Marsden Hospital in London. Thank you. And you're giving a talk tomorrow on the future of kidney cancer treatment. Can you tell me about that? I'm giving the uh, Eugene Schoenfeld uh, lecture, which is a great honour. And they've asked me to gaze into a crystal ball uh, and to, uh, to kind of scope out what I think treatment will be like in the year 2024, 10 years from now. It's always a bit of a challenge to be asked to give a talk like, like that because one never knows what surprising discoveries might be made along the way. But we know where we were 10 years ago with the emergence of the TKIs and the whole issue of anti-VEGF directed therapy and we are now so that one can make a guesstimate of what might happen in 10 years time. And I think the, the new immunotherapies, particularly the immune checkpoint in, uh, inhibitors, are going to be the big story of the next 10 years. And how they will pan out, I think, at the, is still con conjecture. So I think one of two things will happen. Either they will make a small but stepwise uh, increase in survival, in other words, take uh, a group of long-term survivors, say, at the 15 or 20 percent level of our entire patient population and take it to 30 percent, which would be which would be great. Uh, or it might be a much bigger step and, and take it all the way to 50 or 60 percent. And I think that's what we what we don't know. Uh, those percentages really come from the data we have on melanoma and it it, uh, it, it, I, and I say that uh, assuming that uh, the same sort of results uh, will come out of the kidney cancer field. So that, that's one part of the, the next 10 years will be how the immune checkpoint inhibitors will pan out. The other issue really is what's going to happen to VEGF-directed uh, therapy. And I can't see the TKIs staying around in their current form for the next 10 years. I think, and I hope, something else will happen. And I say that because they are not without toxicity and even quite low levels of toxicity. Uh, if someone is on treatment for a year or two years or three years, it is really quite a tough thing to have to endure. And, and, I'm, and I think that there will be some sort of shift there, either the discovery of new molecules that will uh, target uh, uh, VEGF or perhaps different ways of trying to schedule the drugs uh, in a less harmful way. The other big change in the next 10 years may come from radiotherapy, which I think will surprise some people. But the use of CyberKnife uh, and the emergence of proton beam therapy and in the future carbon ion therapy uh, has got us thinking about how we manage so-called oligometastatic disease for those patients who have reasonably slow pace disease. CyberKnife, for example, is a very easy treatment for, pe for patients to get. It's virtually without uh, side effect. Uh, and, and one can imagine in someone with uh, only a handful of metastatic uh, sites, particularly maybe even bone, uh, treating them very early with such a with such a technique. I mean, there's clearly going to be cost implications to that, but uh, certainly at my institution on the kidney cancer group, we have started talking very seriously about uh, the use of radiotherapy and indeed some of the surgical ablative techniques for oligometastatic disease. Uh, a good example of where uh, it may have utility is when a when with a targeted agent you get um, either stable disease or indeed regression in a whole load of tumours but one tumour is growing and is breaking through. It's a classic uh, example where uh, the treatment of, of, of oligometastatic disease to the progression, progressing lesions may benefit the patient. Currently this is all without data in terms of how do the patients fare 
in a, in a randomized trial compared to not doing that approach. But certainly it's something that we should be uh, thinking about. And, and, and finally, uh, I, I hope to uh, talk to my colleagues uh, about the issue of patient uh, consent and patient preference for different uh, treatments. It's very easy to get carried away with novel therapies and not stop to think about perhaps what patients really want because patients with uh, incurable cancers that come to academic institutions like my own uh, come for clinical trials because they want everything possible done. But when, when drugs become uh, more, more widely available and part, become part of standard of care, uh, patient choice is extremely important. And there are data to suggest that doctors don't always get it right in terms of knowing what their patients uh, really want. And I, and I think it's timely in kidney cancer now that we do have some treatments that are uh, reasonably successful. Uh, for us to address those issues as well. Mm -hmm. So on the immunotherapy front, are the, is there the potential for some of the same pathways where we've seen success in melanoma to be used um, at a ba the basic level in, in kidney? The, uh, the, the, currently what, what is happening is that more or less the same immunoth immunological pathways and the same immunobiology is being used across all cancers. and. Perhaps one of the issues in the next 10 years will be, are there different pathways that are important for different cancers? And I think that remains to be established. There's an interesting uh, scientific move uh, afoot, which uh, is starting to bring together tumor immunology and uh, signaling uh, uh, scientists uh, in, in, one, in one place. They were always slightly separate, but there's a real coming together now, particularly because of the immune checkpoint uh, inhibitors, because these are, th these are signaling pathways uh, that can be blocked, very akin to uh, targeted therapy for uh, abnormal signaling pathways uh, in other malignancies. Mm -hmm. And presumably the potential as well for new combinations with immunotherapy. Yeah. So, um, the question of combinations is always asked, and oncologists, oncologists have, a, have a fetish for combinations. It's not always right to put things together. Sometimes sequential treatment is better than combination uh, treatment. And we certainly got our fingers burnt in the chemotherapy era by trying to put too many drugs together. And we indeed, in kidney cancer, got our fingers burnt trying to put uh, the different VEGF targeted agents together, which really has been a bit of an abject failure. So I am not one that would immediately uh, go for combinations unless there was a really good biological rationale for putting two uh, agents together. Then I think um, it's, worth, uh, it's worth doing, but not just willy-nilly, we've got two active agents, let's see what happens when you put them together. Okay, that's it, thank you very much. All right.